Um, I want to open up for some questions if I didn't run over time. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the early decision to restrict scripts to the standard transaction types and moreover if there's any progress or effort or even desire among the core team to loosen those restrictions in the future? Yeah, the question is... The question was about um, restricting scripts to certain transaction types. That was one of those, holy crap, we're going to be attacked, we have to do something. Satoshi took a big hammer and like disabled a whole bunch of opcodes and also uh, kind of whitelisted certain transactions as these are the transactions that we'll accept. Um, I think we just had two transaction types uh, at that time. Um, I mean, the reason Satoshi did that is because we did have one of these, oh crap, you know, a smart person looked at the code and figured out you can cause, like, memory to explode if you create a script that looks exactly like this, um, for example. Uh, I, had actu I was actually the person, I think, who suggested to Satoshi that maybe a white list would work better than a black list, right? Don't try to, don't try to, you know, identify a transaction as bad. Whitelisting tends to work a lot better of, you know, these are the transactions that we know are good. Um, the second part of your question was on opening up that up. Um, it actually is opened up in the 0.10 release. In a pay to script hash, your script can be anything. And you can redeem that script. Um, so that restriction is relaxed if you use to script hash in the 0.10 release. And it'll take a little while for miners to upgrade and the network to upgrade so your transactions will get relayed in mind. But Well, the validator, any, any pay to script hash, basically, there's a little caveat with no ops, but um, any pay to script hash, uh, validation will be relayed as, as valid. So it's, it's, it's opened up in both the funding and the redeeming side. Uh, as of 0.10, which isn't out yet, so you'll need to wait six months before you know, enough miners uh, have upgraded, enough nodes have upgraded, so your transactions will get relayed in mind. questions about the minimum transaction time um, of 10 minutes being too slow. I mean, it's certainly too slow for like in-person use. Um, my opinion is that, you know, there only, there's only one number that, that really matters and that's, you know, the, 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 the instant, tran instant transaction time of, you know, I walk up to a cash register and I, you know, put my phone there, and then within a second or two, the transaction is confirmed, and I walk away with my coffee. Right? I think that that's the only interesting kind of time period. I think anything beyond that, you know, 10 minutes versus one minute doesn't matter. Um, so, you know, the problem you want to solve is how do we get instant confirmation? And there, but there, you know, there are a bunch of ideas on how to do that. Uh, some of which involve a trusted third party that promises not to double spend. So maybe you have some of your coins locked up in a multi-signature wallet. Um, that's the kind of green address idea. Um, there are ideas about kind of risk assessing transactions that are unconfirmed. So, you know, we broadcast the transaction to the network and then very quickly get an idea of like how much of the network has seen it and have you seen any double spends and then maybe you can make some assumptions about how likely is it that it will be double spent and then you know if the likelihood is low enough and the amount being transferred is low enough then you just take the risk and you know you allow the coffee purchase to proceed um, I don't know how that will that's that's something else I don't know I don't know how that will that will all work its way out and which of any, you know, of these approaches will, will, will really take off. Yeah? Um, about the 0.10 update that's going to take like six months essentially, um, are you all tracking kind of what the speed and adoption of, of 
is for the Bitcoin updates across nodes, and are you thinking internally about how you can speed that up so we can get more of like a like really fast iterations that go kind of like Google Chrome or WordPress now with their automatic update stuff? That's a good question for Corey. <laughs> But the question was about um, tracking adoption and then kind of speeding up uh, adoption um, and automatic updates. Uh, I mean, for Bitcoin Core, we've been pretty against automatic updates uh, for a bunch of reasons. Um, you know, partly, you know, we don't want the responsibility of holding keys that would kind of flip a switch on the whole Bitcoin network overnight. That's just you know, not ideal you know nobody wants to hold those keys and even you know some subset of people don't really want to hold those keys jointly that would have that much power um, there's an advantage to having it roll out slowly also right if we screw something up then it affects you know it doesn't affect everybody all at once you know it affects some number of nodes and we can come out with another release to fix something if we if we if we messed up um, certainly with automatic rollouts you could do some scheme where you roll out to you know, certain percentage over time. Um, as far as tracking releases, uh, yeah, there are websites that track, you know, version numbers of clients on the network. Um, and there's actually a really interesting paper at Financial Crypto where they tracked kind of transaction fees and they could look at as transaction fees changed in, uh, in Bitcoin Core, they could figure out based on the transactions that happened, you know, how much of each version of Bitcoin Core were being used at any given time. So that's interesting data too. Um, hope that answers your question. Yeah, in the back. That's a good question. The question was about Nick Zabo. Zabo? Zabo? Anybody know? I'm Zabo, thanks. Uh, proposed Bitgold, which was a, a Bitcoin-like system. And in, Bitco in Bitgold, the value of the tokens were related to the difficulty of creating them, which is not true in Bitcoin, right? It doesn't matter what the difficulty is. Um, you know, you're awarded 25 bitcoins, whether the difficulty is 10 billion or one. Um, I hadn't thought about that. I think it actually probably would have been better if Satoshi had somehow tied the difficulty into the number of bitcoins created. Although, I mean, I think Satoshi did know that, you know, you should try to keep things pretty simple. Uh, simpler is better. Uh, for security and for just, you know, the ability to actually get a system out. So, I don't know, I'd have to think really long and hard about could you come up with a, a system that was more fair because people putting more work into creating these tokens would be rewarded more. I don't know, there, there, there might be some a runaway, uh, runaway effect. I think we're, we're actually over secure with mining right now. And if the higher the difficulty went, the more Bitcoins miners got, I don't know, that might be a, that might create a bad feedback loop. Um, it's an interesting question. Cool. One more question? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, uh, congratulations on the successful 20 megabyte uh, block size task. Oh, that's not done yet. <laughs> um, I, I saw the blog post about it. Um, so I know that the 14 has historically been opposed to loading the blockchain with uh, non-payment transactions, um, suggesting side chains or alternate uh, blockchains as another measure. But um, given the um, what, given uh, Peter Todd's uh, objection to using side chains or anything other than um, new 
kept testing new uh, Bitcoin protocol extensions and the utility of, of uh, having things on the Bitcoin network, do you think that larger block sizes will pave the way to allowing um, more use cases for, for Bitcoin other than monetary transactions, such as maybe larger offer turnout folks or anything similar? So the question was about bloating the block, bloating, scare quotes, the blockchain with non-financial data um, and whether raising the block size will allow more different applications. Um, I mean, the issue of bloating, uh, I think I have a, a slightly different opinion than, than, than some of the other core developers in that I think we should be completely politically neutral about what the blockchain is used for. Um, you know, whether that's paying people for something or whether that's as a ledger that just records, you know, transactions. Uh, I think we need to be politically neutral and let the fee system do what it's designed to do and let the, the most valuable uses of the blockchain kind of pay to use that global ledger. Um, so I, th I think that's a little different from, from some other people who have, you know, really strong feelings about people who want to pay to put other kinds of data in the blockchain. I think a lot of this will go away once we have pruning. People will start to realize that the blockchain is not a permanent record. If you want a permanent record, you probably, you know, need some other system, a permanent record of, you know, like large amounts of data. The blockchain is just not designed to do that. It's designed to, you know, be a transaction system where you have a ledger with a kind of currently open set of transactions that haven't settled yet. Um, will increasing the block size enable other applications? Um, I think it will, it will make Bitcoin transactions cheaper, right? That will be the primary thing is you can have more transactions that cost less. Now, whether or not that enables other applications of the blockchain, uh, I think it depends on how cheap transactions get. Um, maybe, I mean, you know, uh, I think it would be okay. <laughs> you know, I can't speak for the rest of the core team. Uh, and, 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 and the, the, the core team tends to be incredibly conservative, right? That's why we started with a 40 byte op return. There's a pull request to increase that to 80 bytes right now that I think the winds are blowing. It will probably be accepted and so it'll be allowed to, you know, associate an arbitrary 80 bytes with each transaction. Um, there are all sorts of tricks you can play if you want to store more data than that. Um, certainly with the P2SH opening up for any transaction, basically, you know, you can suddenly store a bunch of data in your script signatures, uh, for example, if you really, really want to. They will get pruned away, um, and so, you know, people won't have to store those for you, and that's, you know, that's the way it should be. Um, I think it's interesting that if like the block size does not change, it's possible that non-financial transactions might start to push out the financial transactions because, you know, if you're recording a car title on the blockchain, maybe you're willing to spend 10 bucks, whereas I'm not willing to spend 10 bucks to, you know, to, to buy, well, a cup of coffee is probably a bad example, to buy, you know, a month worth of, uh, of uh, web server hosting or whatever. I think we're done with the questions. I'll be around all day, so uh, come grab me. Thanks. Thank you, Gavin. Before our next uh, presenters come up,